we looked at eight verses through the, and, and looking at the, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Any, any uh, feedback or anything that struck you that as you left that you kind of thought more about? Was there any, any more continued conversation around uh, last week's conversation? You're just eager to move on. Yes, ma'am. If you so, um, Ellen is recommending that that um, I I suggest that you should re be reading ahead. You know, so before you come in, you should at least have have previewed potentially what we're going to be looking at. Ellen is suggesting that when you go home, read it again, because now that you've had this conversation, you can you, things are going to start popping out at you uh, in a in a different way, and you'll understand it and view it in a very different way. And hopefully, too, some of the visuals will kind of give you that that opportunity as well. I'm feeling like I need to move closer. Um, uh, any other comments? You just want to move on, okay? So today. Um, we're going to do more than, than eight verses. Um, we're going to actually, we're in chapter um, six, starting at verse nine, and we will go through until chapter 17. Um, I am going to, chapter seven, okay. There, there are two things going on here. One is that I had a very impacted weekend uh, and a part of that was a dear friend's brother uh, at work fell. Um, I don't necessarily. Let's, let's pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of the faithful, grant that by the same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise and ever enjoy his consolations through Christ our Lord. Amen. So in today's study, what we are going to be looking at um, is the opening. 
Yes, I did turn it back on. Thank you. Um, so good. Um, we're looking at the opening of the fifth seal and the sixth seal. And um, I, uh, I apologize um, that I have, was not more uh, conscientious of this in terms of telling you the, when I know the artwork, who is the artist. Um, so um, uh, a lot of comments, we, we, actually there's a couple of us that were standing here towards after everybody else left just looking at those four horsemen of the apocalypse. And, um, and who was the artist? And I did discover who the artist is and so if anybody's interested, um, I honestly don't remember who, right now, but it, it is on the bottom of my notes now. So those of you online, it will be on those notes, but I can email out the artists of last week's picture. This one is uh, the opening of the fifth and sixth seals uh, by Matthias Guren, uh, painted in the 15th or the 16th century. Um, and uh, just looking at some of the images, it gives you a, a precursor of what it is that we're gonna be reading. Um, so where, uh, and what scholars, um, some scholars, well, most scholars, Catholic scholars suggest what we, are, what we have in these opening of these six seals is a, a microcosm of what we have in Revelation. So seals one through four um, focused on what was going to be happening to um, uh, first century or uh, to Jerusalem and the temple in 70 AD. You know, the releasing of the, of the judgment upon the city, uh, the, um, this, this organization um, that put God to death. Okay, that makes sense? So, and what we see in, this, in the fifth seal is um, an, uh, a, a preview of heaven, a small preview of heaven. Um, specifically around the martyrs. And then what we see in the sixth seal is what is going to happen at the end of all time. And this is essentially what the book of Revelation is. It is, it is, it looks at, it, it's looking at, in, and so, and it's not, so, hmm, let me take a step back. So if you are reading the book of Revelation and you are thinking that this is in chronological order, Catholic scholarship says you're going to have lots of problems because that was not the intent of, of, the, of the document. Um, that, the, you know, the four horsemen of the apocalypse is going to come and then after the four horsemen is going to be the beast and the book of Revelation flows through those three moments. What's going to happen in judgment to Jerusalem? Um, what, is, what is going to, what our experience in heaven is going to be like? and what is going to happen at the end of all time. And it flows in and out, in and out of, the, of those movements. In the same way it flows in and out of judgment liturgy. Judgment liturgy. Judgment liturgy. Make sense? Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, so let's, let's, we're look, let's, uh, Marcia has the microphone. Didn't get here early enough, Paul. <laughs> yes, it, it, it all, it all, uh, it all just, it all justice. She did only get eight verses last time, so, so we're going to start um, uh, in chapter six at verse nine with the fifth seal. When he broke open the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slaughtered because of the witness they bore to the word of God. They cried out in a loud voice, How long will it be, holy and true master, before you sit in judgment and avenge our blood on the inhabitants of the earth? Each of them was given a white robe, and they were told to be patient a little while longer until the number was filled of their fellow servants and brothers who were going to be killed as they had been. Okay. Um, comments, observations. So, Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, what's happening to Jerusalem and the temple in 70 AD. Now we're looking up into the heavens, and we're seeing in the heavens 
that the altar of God, and under the altar of God, are, are all these individuals in white robes. Who do you think these people in white, white, it tells us in the scripture, but how do you understand these people in white robes below the altar? They're the martyrs. Who is a martyr of faith? Who, how, uh, I am 10 years old and I've come to you and uh, I've just heard about martyrs. Tell me, what is a martyr? Someone who has died for the faith. Someone who has, who has been in, is basically, uh, for whatever reason, we, we have martyrs to the, in this present day. Um, what, uh, there were so many of the Christians in the Middle East, um, just in recent times, that were displaced from their homes and killed as they are leaving, simply because they're Christians. Okay? To, from that extent to um, so many of the saints, um, uh, the, the testimony or the witness of the of the saints that uh, who was it that was um, boiled in or was was uh, put on was Lawrence. Saint Lawrence. So he was he was he was put on, over an open fire, and you know the idea of his being cooked and and he calls out at some point, turn me over, I'm done on this side. <laughs> How true that is, I don't know. Um, but, you know, they, they deny Christ or we will kill you. Um, our recent, recently um, instituted Saint um, uh, Oscar, uh, uh, Oscar Romero, um, he was in El Salvador. Uh, he uh, was the Archbishop of Nicaragua. Um, and uh, as he is, he is... Um, at mass, and he is elevating the host during the consecration. A lone gunman comes in and shoots him. And, and some would say, well, no, that was a political thing. Well, yes, it was a political thing, because guess what? Faith is political. And so he was, he was speaking out against the atrocities that were happening to his people and to his priests and, and, uh, and religious that were, were being killed um, because of faith. Um, and, and, and so to silence, and he was giving, he was fortifying the people to hold on to their faith rather than to, to oblige themselves to the, the, the government. And, and so he was killed. He was, he was shot. So these are the martyrs of faith. Um, comments, questions? Yes, Paul. Yes. Uh, the book of Daniel, again, this is, uh, um, uh, Again, one of the things that my, my thoughts in the back of my mind is, you know, I have no idea what we're going to study next year um, because I've thought, oh, the prophets would be really good to, you know, to look at. And then I thought, ooh, the Gospel of John, having gone from Revelation to John. Um, and, that, and I've also thought about the book of Daniel because Daniel is a, apocryphal in terms of not only looking at the, mom, the contemporary moment but s speaking to um, what first century um, uh, events. So, yeah. Um, but, any, but any other comments? Okay, good question. Good question. Okay. So, um, that, that uh, you had, okay. So, one of the things I want to point out is that this, the, and I don't know the, the who was the, uh, oh no. This is by Theodore Wright. This, this picture is by Theodore Wright. Artwork by Pat, you're right, Smith, Pat Smith. Okay, well, Theodore Wright is not right. <laughs> when I, so it just tells you you have to be really careful with Google because I Googled this and that's who they said was the author. So, okay. Uh, anyway. The altar, the picture, what you see here is a close resemblance to what would be the altar of sacrifice uh, in the temple. And so um, uh, the, the, the animals were brought and um, so we, what we have to, um, even to this day, an Orthodox Jew and, and many, many people believe that the soul of the person or the, the creature is in the blood, okay? And so the blood of, of, of anyone 
is sacred. That's why to eat kosher to this day means you, do, you eat something that has been, com any meat that has been completely drained of its blood because you do not want to consume the soul of another creature. Okay? So Orthodox, uh, a, a, an Orthodox Jew, um, there are only certain places in the country that they can get their meat. And there's, they're co eating kosher is much more than just the meat they eat. But, and, and there's a very ritualistic way of, of um, uh, butchering the animal, uh, one that respects the life of the animal so the, the death is done quickly. Um, and then the blood is drained, and it's not just thrown away. It goes back to the earth. Um, and, uh, and there's prayers that are said over the animal. That, that's all a part of what, what um, uh, out of respect. Um, the, um, so the idea is that the, when, when in the time of Christ or, uh, and centuries before that, when a, an animal was sacrificed in the temple, they were placed upon the altar and their throat was slit and the blood, allowing the blood to drain off and drain down. Okay, so th um, yeah, it sounds really gross and gruesome, um, but, huh? It is, it is. But the symbolism of it, is, it the idea is that, that scripturally speaking, the, the, uh, the blood rolling down means that it is, it's, it's an acceptable sacrifice. So the, why are these people underneath the altar? Their blood, which was drained in faith for God, is an acceptable sacrifice. That's a, that's a very long-winded way of explaining the, the association of why the image would be of being under the altar. Um, and it, it's important to understand that it's, uh, and I'm just going to read from my notes because I'm, my brain is, I'm in that, that stalled mode in my brain, can't get it started. Um, it is not that the Lord delights in human sacrifice or suffering, um, very far from that, uh, but it is in the mystery, mysterious plan of salvation that the work of evil in the end brings about the salvation of the world. Um, think about Christ on the cross. Okay? Um, Jesus relied on evil acts to uh, perpetuate, perpet, per, uh, acts done on him um, at his passion and death to bring about the salvation of all. So martyrs' death participate in that same act. So there, that the salvation... Um, so Christ dying, being, being beaten, um, mocked, um, tortured, and then dying on the cross, you know, horrific. Who, who would want that? Um, but God relies on, and like we talked about earlier, why would God allow all this catastrophe and all these horrific things to happen? Those horrific things often turn people's minds to God and in the end bring them to faith. And so it's not that God makes earthquakes happen. And it's not that God makes um, um, devastation happen. You know, God did not make 9-11 happen. God did not say to, okay, these individuals get in a plane and fly into the World Trade Center. God did not make that happen, but God does use, God, in the scriptures it said, God takes crooked lines to, and makes them straight. So God uses this, um, uh, allows it to prick our consciences so that we, we come, uh, we walk closer to God in faith. Um, and so the, 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 the the, the death of, of people, uh, of the martyrs, is in that, is in that same um, uh, realm of sacrifice. Not of the animals, but the sacrifice of Christ. Make sense? Okay. Um, further in, in verse 10, you will, we read, um, they, so the martyrs are now under, they're, they're in heaven, um, having been ex accepted, and um, uh, honored by God, um, they, they now cry out in a loud voice, how long will it be, holy and true master, speaking to God and to Jesus, before you sit 
before you sit in judgment and avenge the blood on the inhabitants of the earth. Who are the inhabitants of the earth? Not me. Well, hopefully not me. The, huh? Nope. Martyrs are in heaven. The inha so, and, it, and this is a trick question. So the martyrs are crying out for, for vindication. You know, these, the, the evil that has been per perpetuated upon us, when are you going to do something about that, God? When are you going to, to vindicate our deaths on the inhabitants of the earth? St. John, um, in, uh, in the book of Revelation, there are nine times he uses the inhabitants of the earth. And from those nine times, we can deduce that these are the people who are unrepentant and unbelieving in the face of, of knowing a God. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so uh, in chapter 3, um, the, inhabitants, uh, the, the inhabitants of the earth will be subject to the coming trial on earth. Um, here... Uh, in verse uh, in 610 kill Christians because of their witness um, in chapter 813 will be struck by three woes and don't worry we'll talk about those when we get there um, in uh, chapter 1110 are tormented by the testimony of the two witnesses and rejoice in their death um, uh, in chapter 13 worship the beast um, and again in chapter 13, are deceived by the false prophet. Getting an idea of a theme here? You know? Um, it's chapter 17, they drink of the wine of Babylon's immorality. Um, and in 17, do not have their names written in the book of life. And that final statement, that final um, uh, passage, gives testimonies to who these inhabitants of the earth are. Um, the Book of Life, remember we've talked about the Book of Life. The Book of Life is that book, um, symbolically speaking, which all of our names are written in. Those who have, who have committed their lives and, and are, live, are working to live a life worthy of Christ. Not saying perfect, just saying that they're make, we make effort. Um, their names are not in it. So that must mean if, they're, if, if their names are not in it, then they... They know who God is, but they are unrepentant, and they choose not to follow that God. So that's the inhabitants of the earth. So the, the, in, this, in chapter 6, the martyrs are calling out for vindication against those who perpetrated their deaths. Okay? Um, it, it makes sense? Okay. Um, any comments? Yeah. We, uh, so uh, Nancy's question was, are we also not inhabitants of the earth? And we are, but, in, but we have to look at the, the phraseology and how it's being used within this document. So um, uh, it, it would be similar to my, um, my, my saying, um, oh yes, he was a friend of mine. Okay, so to just look at it as... as um, uh, it's a word, friend. We all know what friends are. So inhabitants, we're all inhabitants of the earth. But note the eye roll and the sarcasm in my voice. The eye roll and the sarcasm in my voice tells you that, they're, that this individual is really not a friend of mine. That makes sense? Okay. So that's why, that's why uh, it, the, uh, the, why I so enjoy the study is because in my own reading of this, this is, I'm going, well, wait, I'm an inhabitant, and does this mean I am going, you know, that they want my death as well? Um, and, but the, the scholarship looks at the whole story, a whole picture, and looks for the eye roll and the sarcasm. So basically, it's evil. It's evil. It's the, those who perpetrate evil. Those who choose to perpetrate evil in the face, especially in the face of God. Yes, sir. Are these people that per, uh, perpetuate evil that are called the inhabitants of the earth, are they in the book of life to begin with and they fall out of the book of life or are they never in it? 
that that I can't answer. Um, so the question for those who didn't hear is, is is everyone's name written in the book of life, and then you have to you have to basically erase your name from it, kind of what you're saying. Um, right. Consequently, if you per perpetuate evil being baptized, do you fall out of the book of life? Um, so we, 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 we can't, and I know that this isn't what you're doing, but we can't think in terms of a literal book of life. We have to think in terms of a relationship with God. The book of life is, is, is a symbolic image of, of this relationship we have with Christ. So basically to answer your question, Christ or God wants to be in, in love and in relationship with every human being. We have the power and control of saying, yes, I will be in relationship with you, and, or no, I will not be in relationship with you. Some people um, oh, choose from the beginning. Nope, I, I would rather chase money or power or prestige or sex or whatever, uh, rather than to worship God. Um, there are some people who say yes, and then they fall away. Um, it has everything to do with not a single decision, but it has to do with the way one orders their, their entire life. Does that make sense? So I can't answer the, the whole idea. I, I cannot, I, I'm choosing not to speak for God. I, I know what the, that the Catholic Church teaches is that, um, that with baptism, um, and we're going to talk a little bit about that soon, that with baptism, we are, our lives, our parents, for most part, as an adult, if we get baptized, we are choosing to order our life towards Christ. But that, as we all know, is a daily mission and a, da and a, and a daily commitment that not everyone is willing to take. So what happens if, okay, I... I, I get baptized, I get confirmed, and then I go the way of the world. Does that mean I'm not getting into heaven? Can't answer that because I've not had that, um, had that conversation with God. Um, the church teaches that, that in God's mercy, and we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, in God's mercy, um, certainly there would be one more opportunity to right themselves, and that's why we believe in purgatory. Because no matter how much I try to do the right thing, I still, I'm still falling. I'm, I'm still a fallen individual, and I don't, I don't um, always make the right choices. And so I have this, this opportunity between death and heaven to, to cleanse myself of the sins that I've... And, and my philosophy is do the work now or do the work later. It's, it's really your own choice. Okay, make sense? Yes, sir. I would think everybody would be in the book of life right from the beginning, and then it's our choice to get out of the book. Yeah. Because I, I look at it as a You know what? Hold on. Um, rather than me repeat this, this that, that whole conversation, or that whole statement. I would think that like I say, everybody would be in the book of life and that would be our choice to take ourselves out. Right. And one of the reasons why I say that is, is God, when he made the earth, right, he said everything is good. Right. So he right. made us, so we're good. We're the ones that would choose to take ourselves out of it. And basically Catholic teaching is that, that what you're saying is right. Um, the... And again, we can't think in terms of a literal book of life. Like we're going to, we're gonna, uh, as we move on, we're going to get into some numbers. They're symbolic. So we can't think in terms of an actual book of life. We have to think in terms of a relationship. And even as a, as a parent myself, um, uh, when, I, when, my, when my daughter was conceived and after she was born, I loved her. You know, what did this thing do? All it did was poop and cry and, and you know, <laughs> keep me awake all night. Um, but I loved her, and so if I if that's my if that's true of me, then is how much more true of that going to be of God? 
and 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 as parents we all those of us who are parents or all of us have friends and relationships you have to do if you truly love someone you really have to do a lot they have to do a lot to get out of of you may not like them but you you will love them and so in that that love of grace or that love in grace we have to trust that that even if we really 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 screw up that god's mercy and compassion go goes back to to the the scene of the the pro, of the forgiving father remember mm-hmm. running towards us okay yes what about the um, people that murder christians in the name of allah so what about the people who murder christians in the name of allah um, and and we can't just um, so to point the finger at any one group, we have to point it back at ourselves. Because remember the Crusades mm-hmm. and the, the thousands, if not millions, that, that, um, uh, of Muslims that the, the church killed in the name of Christ. Um, and I, you know, quite honestly, um, I, I, I can't speak to that. I, I, it is not in God's eyes. It is not something God would want. In the same way that, that there are times, that, and there's, there, are two, there are two things going on. One is the individual who truly believes that they're doing the right. Well, in their truly believing they're doing the right. Simple, it's very simple example, probably not all that appropriate, but, uh, but it's, it speaks to my simplistic mind. Um, how many of you parents had your kids, you just planted this beautiful garden of flowers and had your three or four year old go out and pluck all the blooms off and bring them into you and say, oh, here mommy, I love you. In all sincerity, um, they did the wrong thing, but they had love in their heart. So. I, uh, in my simplistic mind, I've got to believe that there has to be some in that merciful God coming, running in compassion, um, uh, forgiving them. But again, it's not like they're going to get off scot-free. They, there is, they have to deal, once they recognize the errors of their way, they're going to have to um, uh, uh, do penance for all the death that they've, they've incurred. The other side of that is, is those who perpetuate evil for their own delight. Does that make sense? Or their own glory or their own power. Um, what com- the person who comes to mind is Adolf Hitler. Um, you know, uh, the atrocities that he, that he and his followers, I, you know, I don't know we as a faith uh, catholic faith believe that in that moment crossing over from life into death and they stand before god could they still be forgiven of their sins absolutely merciful god but again it's not like they're getting off scot free they have to deal with all the sin that they perpetuate that they 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 invested in and they perpetuated um but if not as inhabitants of the earth, according to St. John in Revelation, um, they, they are spe- there are special places in hell for them. Because you either accept and belong to God or you don't. And while as a, uh, when I was a child, this meant, meant absolutely nothing to me, and, uh, but as an adult, I get it. Heaven is being um, in the presence of God. It's being in the presence of love. It's being surrounded by all the positive joy and happiness and, um, and uh, acceptance and healing and all the things that we, we pray for in our lives. And we, we tend to image that by being with our loved ones. And, um, and for me, um, you know, that, that perpetual feast, come, eat, eat. Um, hell is is complete absence of God. So that means the complete absence of all that is good and loving and kind and compassionate. And so it's, it, we, and we symbolize that with, with uh, eternal fires and, and, um, and fear and torment. 
um, I, um, I think it's um, the philosopher um, Sartre. Uh, his idea of hell, think of your worst fear. Whatever your worst fear is, that's, that's hell. That's what you will know for all eternity. So if you're claustrophobic, you will be in, encased and not be able to get out. If, uh, if you're homophobic, you will, you will be constantly battered and, and, and uh, sought after. That makes sense? You're, whatever your worst fear is, that's hell. Um, according to Sadrat. I, I believe it's Sadrat. Um, okay, any other? Does that? Oh, you have a perplexed look. We'll let Maureen talk first. I'm with you if you have a perplexed look. <laughs> no, she has a perplexed look. Oh. Um, I always go back to when people in, what, the first century read thing, things like this or hear about it, do they understand that snarky remark, inhabitants of the earth? Yes. Okay. So, again, we, what we, uh, we, 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 I go back to what I said on the first couple of sessions. We cannot read first century documents in 20, with, with only 21 century eyes. And so that's why we take time to understand the images. Like, um, uh, uh, why are these people under the, under the altar? That makes absolutely no sense to me. Um, but 20, in the first century, especially the Jewish Christians, who would then be able to explain it to the Gentile Christians, oh, well, the altar, and it meant acceptance, and, and so they, they would have been able, um, and they would have seen the document as a whole. Mm -hmm. not verse by verse, which is, again, why Catholic scholarship, when you study the Bible, you, you look, yes, while we're looking at one verse, it, we have to take it within the context of the whole chapter and then the whole book, and that's why we, why this, like I even have this up on. Did you want to, with your perplexed look, or do we want to move on? It's, it's, it's a way of explaining evil. Yes. And it depends on the time that you're in. Yeah. Because we have good and we have evil in this earth. And it's fun to play around with the good, but we have to understand that there is evil. Yeah. And that's all. Isn't that it in a nutshell? That's it in a nutshell. Did everybody hear and understand? So it, it comes down to the idea of, of how we understand good and how we understand evil. And, and, um, and so in a nutshell, this, this whole conversation is if we understand, uh, if, if, so as an individual, as one who has been raised in faith and has tried to live a life of faith, I have this, this view of what good and evil is. Um, and and a, one of the greatest um, ad campaigns that the devil ever perpetuated in the world was that he really doesn't exist, that evil doesn't exist. Because um, going back to the days when we remember little angel, little, little devil, well, I don't have a devil, and I really don't want to do, they're, they're, this devil's not here, and I really don't want to do what the, the angel's telling me to do, but there is no consequences if I do whatever I want to do. Make sense? So it's how we understand good and evil, but it's important, and, and that's why, you know, sometimes these are uncomfortable images or uncomfortable conversations, but it's important for us to understand. It's a choice, yes, but there are consequences to the choices that we're making. And we may not necessarily even in our lifetime see or experience them. It might be other generations who see and experience them. Um, I, I, as a matter of fact, um, uh, no, no, I'm going to move on. Any, uh, so and my perplexed look was I'm thinking about all those saints and popes that are now buried underneath altars all over the European churches. Oh, actually, so yeah, so she had yeah, all these popes and saints that are buried under altars. And South America has some. Yes, yeah. and in, uh, in every consecrated altar, so you can, for those of you who are, are um, uh, members of other churches, when you go, you can ask, and those of you who are at St. Colette's, Father Gary's not going to appreciate this, um, in every consecrated altar, is a marble stone or a, some kind of a stone that has relics of a saint. And that's why in the first centuries, remember catacombs and the saints, uh, the, the Christians, 
um, hiding in the catacombs. Where did they have their masses? On the crypts of saints. So the, the, the bones of the saints were underneath. So it, it's, thank you, that's uh, that the idea of that, the, the acceptance that a part of what makes something holy is the association with something holy. Um, uh, uh, we all know about burying St. Joseph in the backyard to sell your house, yeah. okay? Yeah. And it seems silly, but, but um, when you, are, you don't have access to uh, a, a, a priest or a bishop to bless um, wild, wild west, several hundred years ago, these religious communities would come from Europe and they would come to establish um, uh, their, their convent or their religious order out in the wild, wild west. But there was no priest or bishop to consecrate the land. They would bring with them from their mother house um, a, a blessed relic that they would bury in the ground that would then bless the land for their community. It's, it, it's by association. You want to be good? Hang out with somebody good. You want to be cool? Hang out with, hang out with uh, John Glennon over there. Um, you know, you, you want to be cool? You hang out with the cool kids. You want, you know, it's, it's, it's that's a part. Make sense? Okay, we're going to move on just because... Um, all right, so, um, and then we have um, in, in verse 30 about the receiving of the white robes, or verse 30, um, in verse 11, each was given a white robe and they were told to be patient a little while longer until the number was filled and their fellow servants and brothers um, who were going to, be, you know, so this is a view of, of the heaven in the future. Um, and so this is, a, this is looking at all this, the martyrs, not just the first century martyrs, but all the martyrs of faith. Um, uh, and, they, and we know that the white robe means what? Purity and righteousness, okay? So they, they are recognized by God that, they, that, that their sacrifice was truly acceptable, okay? Um, so now we're going to look at the sixth seal. Um, so we're going to read um, verse 12 through to the end of the chapter. Then I watched while he broke open the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake. The sun turned as black as dark sackcloth, and the whole moon became like blood. The stars in the sky fell to the earth like unripe figs shaken loose from the tree, in a strong wind. Then the sky was divided like a torn scroll curling up, and every mountain and island was moved from its place. The kings of the earth, the nobles, the military officers, the rich and the powerful, and every slave and free person hid themselves in caves and among the mountain crags. They cried out to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of the one who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Because the great day of their wrath has come and who can withstand it? Okay. So, um, great chaos and tragedy leads some to deeper faith. Great chaos and tragedy leads others still to not want to acknowledge God. If you had what the was just talking about, wouldn't you want to go, oh God, save me? But that last verse, uh, the last, for, uh, last part of verse 16 and 17, what are, what are the, in, the inhabitants of the earth? What are they crying out? Fall on us. Kill us. We would rather die than to, not, than to, to, to uh, worship and honor God in heaven. I just, I just struck me just in this moment. Okay, um, comments, questions, concerns. So this vision is not a new vision. We talked about this last week, um, both in Matthew and Mark, when Jesus uh, was giving his discourse um, about the end of, of all time. So again, this, the breaking of the sixth seal is, is a look into the distant future of the end of all time. What is going to happen? 
And what did Jesus say? Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from the skies and the power of the heavens will be shaken. All right. Um, now, this, ta this vision talked about um, uh, the, the, the earthquake and the sun turning black and the moon becoming like blood. Um, and the stars, at verse 13, the stars in the heaven fell from the earth, like un, unripe figs. So Jesus, this, this is only, there's an image that I found. Couldn't find the author of that one. Not that if I did, it would be the right <laughs> name. But, um, but it, it, it's, it, uh, it is it's the, this idea of, of a complete uh, destruction of the earth. Um, uh, let's see. Um, big, meltdown. big meltdown, yeah. And you know when they when uh, when you when you listen to um, uh, uh, I don't even know um, uh, physicists and they and they talk about the end of time and the end of the world and how how many billions of years we have yet. But at some point, our sun is going to go nova. Okay, and and when our sun goes nova. It, it literally explodes, and so it, it's a, they say um, our nuclear explosion like a bazillion times more. Um, so when it goes nova, we're going to go nova, all right? Um, any other observations or comments? It's quite a prophecy. It is. They had the moon having light. We all know now that the moon doesn't have light, but this is still holding on. It's sudden blowing up. Yes. Yeah, yeah. The the idea of the sun, it was then, now, and it yeah, that that's same, same it, and it's not to say that that um that God could not at any moment decide, well, tomorrow's the day, I'm I'm done, I'm tired. <laughs> I I wanna rest from all this, so we're gonna um but it the, the Catholic Church also does believe in evolution, that, that the theories that of how the world came to be, uh, scientific theories of how the world came to be, is not in contradiction with um, our belief system. And so how the world could come to an end by science is not necessarily in contradiction to our, our belief system. Um, if, I want you to look at verse 15, and I just want you to count with me. Um, so the kings of the earth, the nobles, the military officers, the rich, the powerful, every slave and free person. How many? Okay. What does seven mean? All. So essentially the inhabitants of the earth, you know, those who stand in opposition to God. Um, uh, that it, it's the idea of everyone, uh, without naming, a, giving a list of everybody's name, but every, every, everyone who, so all the people who, who are in power, all those who, um, who are, um, find themselves uh, humble, poor, slaves, and those who are just everyday people, all, everyone who stands in opposition of God is going to find themselves uh, facing this reality. Um, okay. Any, any last uh, comments, concerns before we move on into chapter 7? Yes, ma'am. Well, it depends on, on what you believe. So the question is, does this just pertain to our earth and planet or does this uh, pertain to the whole, whole universe? Um, if you are, are of, of the belief that we are it, there is no life outside of this planet, then it's just talking about us. Um, but for those of us who believe that, in, a, that in, in this massive universe that God has created, um, that there is the possibility of other life, it's talking about all of life. That there will come an end of all time and all life on, on in the universe, but we, life will then continue in heaven. My, my understanding. Okay. Um, before going into chapter 7, um, I just want to read one of the commentaries. 
uh, as we leave this cataclysmic event. Um, the calamities that accompany the four horsemen occur in every age and always serve as, as invitations to conversions, to conversion. Martyrs whose, whose shed blood demands requital will continue to be killed until the age comes to a close. When that day comes, it will arrive with terrifying and irresistible force against all, great or small, who resist, who persist in doing evil. Rather than present a timeline in neat chronological order, the book of Revelation instructs its readers by multiple retellings of the final period of human history, focusing on different aspects of the story with each repetition. So this is from uh, Peter Williamson's uh, Catholic commentary on Revelation. So again, it's just this idea that we're, we're going to be, we're going to revisit these images to some degree, but in a different way. Um, and it, it, yes, they sound horrible, but it's, 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 it's not that God is causing this to happen. It is that God is using this to bring about um, conversion. Um, using this moment to bring about conversion. And, and another simple way of looking at, at this, horrible things happen in our lives. Anybody here not have, you know, anybody here have had a perfect life? Raise your hand. You know, nothing but joy and, and ice cream and unicorns and rainbows. Okay. For those of you who can't tell, they're all laughing. Um, in any of those moments, we have a choice. To, see, um, to seek God out and to see this as an opportunity to fortify ourselves or we see it as an opportunity to walk away from God. That isn't to say that in, in, uh, in the diagnosis of cancer or um, a loss of a loved one or um, uh, something, you know, some, something horrible happening to us that we don't get angry at God. God can handle our anger. Um, but it is, it is what we do after the anger, you know. Um, do, we, do we walk away or do we trust that in, in it not making any sense to me, um, there is a plan and a purpose to it. And, and I will continue to walk with you, God, even though I don't get it. Make sense? Okay. So now we're going to look at um, chapter 7. We're going to uh, read seven, chapter 7, 1 through 8. And for those of you who would like to look at the image while Marcia's reading, go ahead. Beautiful. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth so that no wind could blow on the land or sea or against any tree. Then I saw another angel come up from the east, holding the seal of the living God. He cried out in a loud voice to the four angels who were given power to damage the land and the sea. Do not damage the land or the sea or the trees until we put the seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. I heard the number of those who had been marked with the seal, 144,000 marked from every tribe of the Israelites. 12,000 were marked from the tribe of Judah, 12,000 from the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 from the tribe of Gad, 12,000 from the tribe of Asher, 12,000 from the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000 from the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000 from the tribe of Simeon, 12,000 from the tribe of Levi, 12,000 from the tribe of Issachar, 12,000 from the tribe of Zebulon, 12,000 from the tribe of Joseph, and 12,000 were marked from the tribe of Benjamin. Let's give her a hand for those names. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, something that I um, uh, did not look into, well, no, maybe, uh, never mind. Um, comments, questions, ideas? Yes, ma'am. Right, yeah. So, uh, so the, the naming of the, of the 12 tribes, he said, you know, uh, 
for each of the 12, and then he identifies just, just to make sure that nobody feels like they're being left out. I mean, that's what I would, I would suspect is a part of it. Um, uh, what is 12 times 12? Uh, and what does the number 12 mean? Totality, all of. Uh, uh, Jesus, it was not by accident that Jesus chose 12 apostles. He chose 12 apostles to represent in the new age the 12 tribes of Israel. God chose, um, chose uh, ja um, uh, Jacob, who later was named Israel, who had 12 sons. And, uh, uh, and actually, I, yeah, I'm kind of curious. I, I need to go back and look at this because Joseph is not one of the tribes of Israel. His son Ephraim and his son um, um, uh, is, uh, took his place as one of the tribes of Israel. Um, so I need, to, I need to go back and kind of look at why they identified Joseph. But the, the, um, uh, the 12 tribes basically meant all of the people of God. The 12 apostles meant was a, the, the leadership of all of the believers of Christ. Okay? Um, so 12 times 12 means everyone. Okay? Everyone who is a believer is going, is going to be sealed. Make sense? Yes, sir. Yeah, so this is where the Jehovah's Witness gets 144,000. And the interesting thing is that there, there, have, there are far more than 144,000 Jehovah Witnesses. So if you take this literally, if you take, this is one of those moments where you have to, you have to really question. If you're taking this literally, guess what? I'm not going to be a person of faith because it's very unlikely that I'm part of the 144,000. All right? But again, the symbolism is 12 is complete. 12 times 12 is completion on top of completion. So that means all. All the believers are going to be uh, brought into. The, so that's why I'd rather be a Catholic than a Jehovah's Witness. Because <laughs> I'm getting into heaven one way or the other. Um, yeah, uh, let's do Ellen. And then Ellen, if you'd pass it back to Paul. Paul can have it. But that knocking right. on the door from the Jehovah's Witness makes you seek out the scripture. Yeah. You know. But see, the, and, uh, the, the, the challenge, though, and I really, um, uh, for most people, it is really not worth having the conversation. Um, knock on the door. You know, we'd like to explain scripture to you, and you're thinking, oh, I've, I've taken Teresa's Bible study. <laughs> I can argue this now. Uh, it's really not worth it. Because it, it really, unless you really want to spend time um, working with this individual to bring them into the faith, into the Catholic faith. Um, because it, it, the, and, and, and I have done this, and in the end, I, 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 I still feel guilty to this day because the person, you know, in scripture when, when it says the, the rich young man, when, you know, the young man comes to Jesus and, and at, after Jesus says, um, love God with all your heart and all your soul and all your, your mind and to love your neighbor as yourself. It was just in our, our readings a few weeks ago. And the rich young man said, well, Lord, I've done all that. Uh, so what more can I do? And Jesus said, um, sell everything you have and follow me. And, he, and the rich young man went away sad because he couldn't do that. And, and I, I, I felt guilty because I, weeks this person kept coming back and we would argue scripture and and they went away sad. And I've, I still feel guilty to this day because, you know, there's no way of following up um, on that. So it's really not worth having those conversations. I just, now this day, and we, um, uh, there, my next door neighbor, um, well, well, I have some people canvassing all the time in my neighborhood and I just opened the door. Hi, hope you're having a pleasant day. I'm a very confirmed Catholic and I have no, no intentions of, of leaving my faith. You have a great day. And I close the door, you know. Or I hide in the back room. <laughs> Paul. Uh, I, I have Scott Hahn's Bible and I can tell you why Joseph is in there. Well, why is Joseph in there? Because the tribe of Dan is omitted. 
Okay. And you still need 12, so he stuck Joseph in there. Okay, so Mr. Smarty Pants, why was the why is <laughs> why is the tribe of Dan omitted? Because they followed idolatry and sexuality. Oh. Okay. Well, thank you, Paul. But that's but that's why it it, it just goes to show reading the notes in your Bible um, can lead to a lot greater understanding. You know. Um, but I want to see your Bible before you, I, I, seriously, I don't have Scott Hahn's Bible, so I'm, I may have to buy a new one. Um, with uh, any other comments, I'd like to, to, to with 144,000, I, I, actually, let's go back up to the beginning of that read, of that, um, of that conversation, um, where it says, uh, after this, I saw the four, uh, the four angels. Um, uh, so... I found that a little bit confusing because if you read it, it says, uh, standing at the four corners, holding back the four winds of the earth and no one, that no wind could blow. So the image is these angels are holding back the four winds, right? Then I saw another angel come up from the east holding the seal of the living God. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. He cried out in a loud voice to the four angels who were, giving, who were given the power to damage the land and the sea. So the four angels are basically, you know, God has said, go out, you can do the damage, but they're holding back. And the angel, the one angel says, do not damage the land or the sea until we have put the seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. And I found that kind of confusing. It was kind of like, well, didn't you just say they were holding back? So it, what basically the image that we are, we are to get there is this idea, go back, to, um, to the, the sixth opening of the sixth seal, um, the, 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 the cataclysm that is about to happen. They're, they're, they, they've been sent out to, to bring God's judgment upon the, the inhabitants of the earth, and they're holding back until the seal of the living God can be put on the four, and it says... Um, Da, 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 the seal of the living God uh, put on the, on the foreheads in verse number, th um, verse number three, on the foreheads of the servants of our God. Okay, so um, it's a little comical, but here is here is the angel with a seal stamping the foreheads of the living God. But. Uh, yeah, the, the idea of the Passover, of, of the mark of the blood of the lamb on the, on, okay, that, I hadn't thought about that, but that's a great, that's a great uh, 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 connection. Um, and what, so a seal, we don't use seals to, to, for the most part today, not like they used to in the time of Christ. But even today, um, uh, uh, we have here at St. Colette's a, uh, a seal and what it does is that you put the piece of paper in the seal and you push it down and it, 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 it embosses, or whatever the word is, and it, so that you know that this is official document, okay? That this is not just some paper. And so essentially what uh, um, the, the passage is saying is that, that those of us who, that there is going to be proof um, that, because you can ask the question, well, couldn't somebody just say that they're, you know, they're a believer? And we all know that God sees into the hearts uh, and minds of all of, of humanity. Um, but this way, there, there is proof that we belong to God, okay? And this, this, this is, uh, if you get the opportunity, I have the passage uh, noted in my, in my notes. This goes back to Ezekiel and Ezekiel's vision in which... God is getting ready to bring his judgment down upon the unrighteous. And, and in the vision, um, Ezekiel see, sees the seal of God placed on the believers. And it, the seal is a tau, a Greek tau. What does that look like? That, you know, we tend to think of a cross, I'm pointing to the crucifix over here, as being... It is more likely that Christ died on a cross that looked like this, okay? Um, but, okay, so if you're all worried 
that I, I haven't got that stamp on my forehead, think about it. That, that, we, that in the Catholic faith, and uh, when we are baptized, that we are, there, it's a baptism and confirmation. Sorry, for those of you over here who can't, I didn't get a chance to push it back. Um, so I have a picture of a baby being baptized and the, and the holy oils, a cross is, is placed upon their forehead. And then at confirmation, there is only one other sacrament in which oil is placed on the head. Anybody want to guess? Well, well, oh, uh, in terms of, yeah, no. Oh, no, actually, it's only on the hands. You're, they're prayed, the, the priest or the bishop will come and pray and lay hands on the person, but the oil only goes on their hands and the sacrament of the anointing of the sick. Bishop. To be ordained a bishop is oils are placed on the head. Okay? But we, uh, the idea here is that we do not have to worry about being, receiving the seal of Christ because we've already received it through the sacrament of baptism and then it is, it, is, um, uh, it is confirmed or it is strengthened in the sacrament of confirmation. And interesting in the, that uh, those two sacraments, it's being welcomed into uh, uh, being named, claimed for Christ, and then being strengthened in confirmation to be a disciple of Christ. That's, that's what baptism and confirmation are meant to be two sides of one coin. Um, so if as an adult, anybody here uh, brought into the Catholic faith as an adult? So uh, were you baptized before in another? Okay, as a Lutheran. Okay, so you were baptized as a baby. If you had not been baptized, um, when you came into the Catholic faith, you would have been baptized and then confirmed on the same night because there are two sides of one coin. Of, does that make sense? Okay. Um, yes, Paul. Yes. <clears throat> so, and and again, so that what Paul what Paul said is that this seal is in contrast to the mark of the beast. But as we I said in my introductory comments. The mark of the beast actually is, ident is most likely identifying um, uh, Rome or uh, Nero Caesar, who was the perpetrator of the destruction of Jerusalem. He, was the, he didn't do it, but he was the guy who commanded. Um, and he created lots of martyrs um, in his lifetime. Um, but it is in contrast to that. Any, any other comments, criticisms, concerns? Um, so here's a, uh, my slide. We got to it before we talked about it, 100, 144,000. Um, and, um, okay, so, uh, da 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 uh, Any, we're going to read the last little section. Um, so we're looking at verse 9 to the end of the chapter. After this, I had a vision of a great multitude which no one could count, from every nation, race, people, and tongue. They stood before the throne and before the Lamb, wearing white robes and holding palm branches in their hands. They cried out in a loud voice, Salvation comes from our God, who is seated on the throne and from the Lamb. All the angels stood around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They prostrated themselves before the throne, worshipped God, and exclaimed, Amen. Blessing and glory, wisdom and thanksgiving, honor, power, and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders spoke up and said to me, Who are these wearing white robes? And where did they come from? I said to him, My Lord, you are the one who knows. He said to me, These are the ones who have survived the time of great distress. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. 
For this reason they stand before God's throne and worship him day and night in his temple. The one who sits on the throne will shelter them. They will not hunger or thirst any more, nor will the sun or any heat strike them. For the Lamb who is in the center of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to springs of life-giving water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So for those of you who, um, especially in, in light of losing someone uh, that you love, you can memorize the last part of verse 17. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Um, and I, I uh, uh, yeah, comments, questions, concerns. Yes, ma'am. So um, you need to go back. I don't remember what session, but go back in my notes because um, we actually had, we talked about this, that what the Catholic Church teaches, and I included in that set of notes the catechisms of the Catholic Church um, in which the, the church talks about that in our belief of a merciful and, and a uh, just God that um, we cannot say that at that at the mo that at their moment of death that God does not um, give them the opportunity to make their lives right with Him. So um, uh, otherwise, but you know, so go go uh, check back a few notes, and you'll and you'll you'll see the catechisms of the Catholic Church that will specifically explain well to, to talk about that. And the question was for those who didn't hear or those who online, what happens to those people who are never baptized and but they live a good and right and righteous life? So any any other comments or questions or concerns? Um, so when I when the first when I first time I read through uh, the book of Revelation and again every time I come to this one point part so in verse 13 um, then one of the elders spoke up and said to me who are these wearing white robes and where did they come from? I, being John, said to him, My Lord, you are the one who knows. He said to me, and then he gives the answer. So um, I, I think yeah, even St. John needed to have a prompter. Um, if you, you know, when you watch or read, read certain books, type of, uh, especially, especially in fiction, do you know why um, Sherlock Holmes needed Watts? So Watts would ask the question so that Sherlock Holmes would explain it. It would be a very boring book if you just had Sherlock Holmes because Sherlock Holmes would never explain why he thought or did or, or acted in a certain way. But Holmes was always saying, why are you doing that? Or what's the importance of that? Or, and, and so this is one of those literary licenses where John, you know, the, John doesn't know to... the. The author, the, um, in the vision, not that I, I am trying to guess God, the method of God's mad, magic in terms of uh, mystery in terms of writing, but God needed to explain. And so he had the elder ask John so that he could then explain um, that these, these are the ones who survived the time of great distress. So we've had, we've had this... This, this scene of the total end of, cate of cataclysm, and even if it's in our own personal history, you know, to know that, that, um, that you know, we, are going to, we are going to be received into the heavenly kingdom um, with, uh, in a sense of being honored and, and recognized for our faithfulness. Make sense? Um, okay, so uh, verse 12. Um, Again, I'm going to read something, and we're going to count. So it says, so um, they're worshiping God, right? And it says, blessing, honor, wisdom, thanksgiving, honor, no. Blessing, glory, wisdom, thanksgiving, honor, power, and might. So what does that mean? All glory, all honor, all adoration is is what we will be doing before the before the throne 
I remember Sister Mary Alafrida saying to me, heaven will be eternally praising God. I get where she gets that. As a, as a, as a six-year-old, I was like, no, I'm, that doesn't sound... So that's why, to this day, I, when I talk to my, my little ones, I talk about heaven being a place with, that's like an um, uh, amusement park. And every ride is free. And it's one amusement park after another. And in the amusement park is all sorts of food. Whatever your favorite food is, and you, you, don't, you don't have to pay for it, and you can eat as much of it as you like. And when you get tired of the amusement park and, and the food, you go to a Toys R Us and every, not that there are Toys R Us anymore, um, but you go to Amazon.com, <laughs> everything is free, you know. And sometimes I think we need to do that for ourselves, is to think, what, what is the perfect place for me? You know, what, what does that mean? Who would be there? And, and, um, and what, would, what would our conversation be? And, and what would we be drinking and, and eating? And, and what would be the setting? Would we be out in the, out in the uh, by a, uh, in a park and by a beautiful lake? Or would we be high on a mountain? You know, because sometimes we need to have a tangible image that we can touch and feel. Does that make sense? We need, we need to have a sense of what is heaven going to be for us. And, it, and the, the reality, and I, when I talk to the kids about the amusement park and Toys R Us and all that, um, uh, the, I always say, and it's so much greater. Because we cannot imagine what God has planned for us. We cannot even begin to fathom the, 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 what God has planned for us. That's why I don't, I, I, I don't get it. I, I must be really stupid why people would not want to be there. Um, anyway. Um, but, uh, last five minutes. Anybody have, want to have their last word or last comment? You, just, you have a question. Yeah, we need to get more microphones and uh, yeah, we can't use the cordless and the the the, the uh, wireless. Okay, let me get out of the way of the camera too. <laughs> <laughs> um, why is there uh, is there a difference between one hundred forty four thousand who are, have the seals on their foreheads, and then the great multitude that he sees a couple of verses later? Yeah, no, no, it's just it's uh, it's just so every year. Okay, so it, it's just, uh, just another way of saying the same thing. Great multitude means beyond all imagination. I mean, bef lo uh, more than we can, can fathom. And so, but the, it, uh, in the same way that's, that as, um, uh, as an educator, my, uh, I will often use different, when I'm teaching a class, uh, we'll use different images. If I'm talking, you know, a couple of years ago I did uh, this, uh, the scriptural basis of the mass and why I bring in stories about um, from my own life and and uh, talk about my daughter or um, different experiences is because they they give they different images speak to different people. Um, what one of uh, what again future study I'd love to just study the parables of Christ um, because they're bas many of them are saying basically the same thing, but. They're, that different images are going to speak to different people. Um, uh, so same, same idea, just, just a different way of saying the same thing, but maybe this time an individual will get it. And the 144,000, the 12 times 12, for those, <coughs> I, I'm just thinking, um, for those who come from a Jewish perspective, that would mean a whole lot. As a Gentile, I don't know that that would mean a lot to me. Um, but great multitude would mean a lot to me. Any other comments, questions, concerns? Then let us pray. Um, we give you praise and thanksgiving for the love that you shower down upon us. We ask, Lord, that as we, um, we reflect on 
the images and the ideas of, of the book of Revelation and, and scripture in general, um, that you continue to inspire us and lead us to walk in our way of faith, um, that you help to guide us, comfort us when we feel the afflictions that happen in this world. Lord, our, our greatest desire is to be counted among the 144,000, um, to be able to, at the end of our days, uh, do nothing more than worship at your throne. We bring all of our prayers together by acknowledging that you are God and we are not, by saying glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. We end as we began in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.